Um, this is the third in a little part of a small series I've been doing, um, uh, which actually came out of just the, uh, the Luke series that we've been doing, um, when the Pharisees were grumbling about Jesus showing love and mercy to uh, uh, what we called the, the sinners, uh, which we all are, of course. And um, I then just spoke the following week on what uh, the love of God means from uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, and then followed that up on another week. Um, just uh, that little part uh, from uh, John 7, 17, or I think it's about there, where it speaks about Jesus saying, uh, if, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. I spoke about the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit can we truly love the way God wants us to love. And so this week, um, I'm... Uh, speaking on life in the Spirit. What does it mean to have life in the Spirit? And I'm going to read, uh, I'd like, I'm going to have lots of different verses, but I'd love you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, verse 8 uh, through to 10. Um, I'm, uh, that's one of the verses I'm going to uh, start with. So Ephesians chapter 5, um, cha uh, verse 8 uh, through to verse 10. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated comes to the light. That's why it is said, wake up at sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I don't know about you, but I am thrilled to be able to say that I am saved. Saved from what I used to be. Who I used to be. You're allowed to look as though you are thrilled. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. This verse means something to me. It describes what I was. And it describes by God's grace what I have become. And what you have become if you have trusted in what Jesus has done on your behalf. It's an interesting verse because it says, you were once darkness. It doesn't say you were in darkness. It says you were once darkness. I was once darkness. That meant if you looked into my soul, you would have seen darkness. Why? Because I was cut off from the light of God. Why? Because of my sin, as the Bible describes it, which I would say was my independence from God, my determination to do what I wanted to do, to live my life the way I wanted to live it. And it cut me off. I was cut off from the very one who wants to give me life and lead me through my life knowing him. You were once darkness, but now, it says, you are light in the Lord. If you have asked Jesus into your life, you are at that moment in the light of God. You're allowed to be excited about that. You're allowed to say, I am so thrilled to you, Lord, for what you have done. And this verse goes on to say that that should lead to some result. It says, uh, live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in goodness, righteousness and truth. Are you excited about that? Do you know, at the end of the last century, in fact, on 31st of December, uh, um, 1999, when um, in, in Australia they were having a celebration, as many people had, with fireworks and all that sort of stuff, um, as the fireworks died down, everyone who was in Sydney saw huge letters lit up. And these letters spelled out the word eternity. Did you know that happened? It did. And actually it was a celebration 
of a man they used to call Mr. Eternity. I need to tell you about Mr. Eternity because actually he was a bit like, um, who's the guy that does all the paintings and nobody knows who he is? Yes, Banksy. He was a bit like Banksy. He would write these words anywhere he could find a flat surface. But I need to take you back a bit. Actually, many years before, he'd been a down and out in Sydney. He'd been a man that you would probably step on the, away from as he walked along the pavement. He was illiterate and uh, he was a vagrant. But one day, he walked into a church in Sydney. And while he was sitting in this church, he heard a sermon. And the sermon basically consisted of a question. And that question was, how and where are you going to spend eternity? How and where are you going to spend eternity? And he was so transformed by that question that he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he asked somebody, teach me to write the word eternity. And with, he was taught wonderful copper plate letters so that in places all over Sydney, he would scrawl this word in beautiful writing, eternity. And people for years wondered who was doing it. But it was this guy who they later discovered his name was a guy called Arthur Stace. And on that evening as the last century closed down, Arthur Stace having died, they celebrated this man who people for years had wondered who it was. And it was the most marvellous way of getting his sermon across. In fact, he preached that sermon thousands and thousands of times and it only had one word, eternity. Listen, if you've given your life to Jesus, you have entered into eternity, as has Arthur Stace. And something dramatic has happened within you, for you've been set free of what you were, and you've been brought into the light of God. Let me take you back, and just for a moment, although you know this, let me just rehearse before you the wonder of what has happened the history that has been, as it were, focused on your life if you've given yourself to Jesus. This whole salvation that I'm going to talk about today, which gives us this life in the Spirit, was inaugurated by Jesus' birth at Bethlehem. Having been authorised by God the Father. This salvation that we rejoice in was achieved by the death of Jesus Christ on a cross, dying as a common criminal for you and me, actually bearing our sin and paying the price for our sin. It was affirmed by his resurrection so that nobody could deny that it happened. He was risen from the dead because he died our death. And yet he had no sin. So sin had no hold on him. And actually, it couldn't hold him. But he was raised by the Father from the dead. As actually was described in Isaiah 53, where it speaks about having suffered, he would see the light of day. As was his whole life described in Isaiah some six or seven hundred years before. Not only was it affirmed, it was celebrated by the, his ascension from this earth where the angel said, this Jesus, who you've seen go, is coming back. And the disciples were thrilled when they heard that. And then, actually, it was then personalised to them at Pentecost, where suddenly they received such power and such love of God that the message that they had to bring, they could bring with an authority that comes exactly from heaven. And you know what? This whole salvation that you celebrate now is going to be consummated one day when his final return happens. And he will say over you, 
something that it will say over me, which you and I do not deserve. Well done, good and faithful servant. I hope that thrills you. I spent five minutes just saying that, but it's a history of the earth that we live in. And it's a history that God wants us to pass on. This verse says, For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, uh, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. That's the next step now from this righteousness that we have received. Do you know there was a, an Aust- no, I think it was Japanese, a Japanese um, evangelist. I'm just looking for his name. I've got it somewhere in my notes. But he, he oh yes, his name rejoices on the, under the, the name of uh, Toyokio Gaia. And he lived, he died in 1960. But he said this, I found it very amusing and yet very thought-provoking. He said this, I read in a book that the man called Jesus Christ went around doing good. And yet it is very disconcerting to me that I am so satisfied with simply going about. You see, this salvation that has brought you into the family of God is supposed to lead somewhere. It's supposed to constantly, daily, get us out of bed and make us say, wow, I've got something to live for. I've got somebody to please. I've got something to say. And as I'm going to lead on to, I've got something to sing about. That's why we sing. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let me just tell you a little bit more of what the Holy Spirit does when you ask him into your life. This is what he does. He cleanses you and cleanses your sin, and cleanses your soul, and makes you new. And by his power, he sets you free from that deep, as it were, sleep of death that we live even though we go on the bus and the train, and actually without him, we're in a sleep of death. But he causes us to be alive in Christ. And then the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, to empower us on a daily basis to be able to please the one who saved us. You see, we're not on our own. As that lovely uh, interpretation was brought this morning, so relevant to what we are here, we're not on our own. We are loved by the living God who's given himself for us. And God wants us to live as children of light. You see, the Bible, it's not just that, uh, that uh, evangelist, that uh, Japanese evangelist who says, you know, I'm, my, what troubles me is I'm so content just to go about. The Bible wants us to go about doing something and carrying something that will extend his kingdom. And so when you get to Ephesians chapter 5, if you'd look to, like to look that up, verse 19, um, it says these words, still in Ephesians 5, it says... Um, Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is something to be going about with. And this something that we can go about with is to honour God in the way we live and the way we speak. And I don't know what you think about that verse. You know, when you read this verse, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and uh, spiritual songs. I mean, what does this mean? Does this mean the church has somehow got to be sort of like a, uh, an opera? You know, where you walk in on a Sunday morning, you go, Ah, oh, morning! And then you sing, I have been saved by the blood of Jesus. I don't quite think it means that. But it does say, it says, It's speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Have you ever considered what that means? I think it means, I I don't think there's anything wrong with singing out the love of God, although if you did it like that, people would probably think you were very strange. But actually it's speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs from the Spirit. 
Do you know what this is saying? It's saying, it's saying your source of conversation, your source of speaking to one another is to be based upon the truth that actually makes you sing. Let me think about this for a moment. Because um, psalms and hymns, have you ever thought about this? It gets mentioned. I don't know whether you've ever considered this verse. Let me read it again. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from you, your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms and hymns, this refers to the reality of life that we have to live, but basing it on the perspective of the love of God. For instance, if you just consider one of the probably the most well-known psalms, which would that be? Psalm 23. What does the Psalm 23 say? The Lord is my shepherd. What does it then say? I shall not want. And it goes on, it speaks, even at the end of it, it says, even though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, what does it say? I will fear. Now, we've, do you see what Paul is trying to say here? Say, listen, church, speak to one another with the reality, the deep truths of God. Let them be the motivational po point that make you speak. Listen, in the world we're living in at this moment, where people, what is on the minds of people at the moment? They're all worried about how they're going to manage here, how they're going to manage... This. Now, listen, I'm not belittling this, but a lot of the fear that's going on at the moment is about what might happen. I know some people have predicted it will happen, but actually, it hasn't actually happened yet. It's on its way. But actually, as those who are speaking to one another with psalms, we're basing it not upon that. We're living our lives not ignoring the situation we're living in, but saying there is a, a greater truth. There is a greater truth that supports my life. There is a greater truth that undergirds my living, my going to work, my coming home, my bringing up my children. There's a greater truth. And Paul said you'll find those in a lot of the Psalms. He also said you find it in a lot of the hymns. What is one of the, the, the most well-known hymns? I mean, we probably could have a debate about this, but which one would you think of amazing? amazing? Um, sorry? Amazing Grace. Is that what you said? Yes, Amazing Grace. Gets sung everywhere. But think of the words. Amazing... Go on, tell me what it is. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. See, it's... it's Paul is saying, remember what has happened to you. When I gave you this little history of what's happened to you when you were born again, it wasn't me just throwing out a few ideas to start things off. I'm basing everything on that, that actually we're to live in the depth of what's happened to us, which is far greater than any of us really realise. The whole of heaven rejoices over the salvation that Jesus has brought. And Paul is trying to say, let this be the motivation of your speech to one another and outside. I, I walk my dog every day virtually in the woods and I meet people and the tone of conversation is nearly always at this moment about the troubles and worries of this life. And I'm saying, God, how may I be, by your grace, a window into heaven for the people I meet? Not that I ignore their troubles or... Just say, oh, don't worry about none of that matters. It does matter. But actually, my response to it, my response, my hope, my sense of uh, security is based upon not a, a shifting system of some man in Russia who wants to create this and do that. No, it's based upon something of God that his word will never pass away. I, I want to tell you a real story that happened only seven years ago. I'm going to read it to you. You may have heard of this one too, but you may not. On April the 29th, 2015, eight convicted drug traffickers were executed in a maximum security prison in Indonesia. Having been sentenced to death years earlier, they were given just a few days' notice of their execution. But the long years in prison had changed them. Seven of them 
had become Christians. And not only had they accepted the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, but they'd also rehabilitated themselves to be upstanding members of the prison system. Even in jail, they had made positive contribution to the lives of other prisoners and sought to pay their debt to society. And so they died as they had learned to live, praising God. They sang hymns like Amazing Grace in their final hours and refused to wear blindfolds as they faced the firing squad. And as the final seconds of their lives counted down, they started to sing a new song, 10,000 Reasons. We sing it here sometimes. The man, one of the pastors who was assigned to each prisoner, one of the ones that was assigned to one of the prisoners, he said this, he said, it was breathtaking. It was breathtaking, she says, this was the first time I witnessed somebody so excited to meet their God. This is true. And Matt Redman, who wrote 10,000 Reasons, I co-wrote it actually, he, when he heard the news, it had a profound effect on him. He said this, I felt majorly encouraged by this little song, that this little song had found its way out there to Indonesia. But I also thought, how astounding an example of worship is that? When people call someone like me, he said, a worship leader, it's almost a joke compared to people facing a loaded gun and still singing out to Jesus. He says this, it made me realise that you can face anything in this life and still sing a song of worship on your lips to Jesus. Anything. I mean, if that isn't an example of this verse, uh, which we have been, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in his hymns. It's amazing. When I, when I heard that testimony, I thought, how eternal is this salvation that we've received? And what's more, I want to tell you this, you guys, you, you could meet these guys. They'll be at heaven's door waiting for you. I, I, I'm always a bit concerned about the one that didn't become a Christian. But anyway, it does worry me. There were nine of them and only, but anyway. Is that the way you're living your life? Is that the way? Listen, I, whenever I, if you're a visitor here in this church, everything I preach are things that God's saying to me. And so when I'm hearing this as I'm preaching it, I'm thinking, yes, I've got to do this, haven't I? I, I I'm as challenged by these verses as you are. Well, I hope you are challenged. I, I'm challenged by it. I, I, you know, I've been thinking, I was walking the dog this morning round the, uh, the park and went out to the bit that's, um, uh, oh, where the cricket ground is. I like to walk round the boundary, right round the boundary of the creek. And I was singing a song to me, and I was saying, I, I, I was singing one that I knew. I, I love it. I can be out there in the open. I can sing as loud as I like, and there's nobody there to correct me if I get the words wrong. But I would like to say this. We, today, we don't know words very often. I mean, it was brilliant this morning. We had the words up at the right time and all that stuff. But, but if the, 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 whatever it is, the video thing had all gone wrong, we'd all be going, blah, 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 blah. Because we don't know the words. Listen, I, I've been saying to myself as I've been thinking about these guys, if I would be you know, just about to be executed, I mean, how many, how many songs do I know that I know all the words to? You know, actually, can I, I, I'm saying something serious here. Paul says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with hymns, psalms and spiritual songs. But listen, you can only do that if you know the words. If you've learned the words, the words get into your soul and then they start to help you. If you're just relying upon reading the words that come up there, they won't be able to do you good. What are we going to do if this persecution comes and, and we're not able to meet like this? What will we do then to sing and bring ourselves before God? Now, that's just a challenge. I've been purposely sitting down and learning the words. And something's been happening to me as I've been learning the words. Wow, I never realised how powerful these words are. And I've been waking, making these words my own. This is what I mean about taking this salvation and moving on with it powerfully so that it becomes part of you. So that you sing, as it were, whether you sing or speak, because it does say speak, 
Listen, it becomes part of you. So that you live on it, being filled with the Spirit. And then what about as, as, so that's just in life. What about, Paul says about the church. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians 14. And uh, when you get to 1 Corinthians 14, 26, you'll find Paul, he's bringing some correction to the Corinthian church where they'd, they'd been baptised in the Holy Spirit, they'd been singing in the Spirit, they'd been speaking in tongues, but it had all got slightly out of hand in that that's all they were doing. And so he says these words in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. I'm going to read it to you. He says this, or I will do if I can find it. What shall we say then, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and somebody must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to somebody who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the control of prophets. It's saying something here about when the church comes together. Now, I think we do well on this. I, I don't think it's, you know, just one person at the front doing it all. I, I love the contributions. I find it, I find it wonderful. But I just want to stir you and uh, lead you on with it. Because, um, you know, it, it, it's almost like I said, you know, we can become complacent. Oh, it's, it's a nice church, people to contribute. But the, the question is, do I contribute? Do, 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 do I come ready to bring? I think that's what Paul's saying here. See, not only in life are we to let the Holy Spirit give us something to sing that will strengthen us, but do I come on a Sunday morning to be blessed? Oh, what will they have for me today? Or do I come bringing something out of the life that I've been living with God for the week? That's the thing that makes the church vibrant. That we're, we're, we're not going through a service. We're, we're, we're going through a result of living before God. And, and it says here, uh, it says a hymn. Um, it, I don't know whether you've ever considered this, but... Um, of all the religions in the world, Christianity is notable for its singing. Have you thought about that? It's notable for its singing. Listen, people sing when they've got something to sing about. And we've got something to sing about. And, um, and, and the words that we sing are important. They matter. They're not just blah, blah, blah words. It's something that's saying something that is important. You know, Charles Wesley, brother of John Wesley, when John Wesley was preaching in this country in 1730, 17 up to 1750, um, most of the people he was talking to uh, couldn't read, couldn't write. So what did they do? John, uh, Charles Wesley wrote words to songs that people could go away with singing. Why? So that they could actually get what was preached into their hearts. And many of our hymns come from Charles Wesley and based upon what Charles Wesley uh, actually brought. Um, what, what does it mean then, this word of instruction? It says everyone has a word of instruction. What does that mean? Well, let me just quickly run through what I think it means. It's maybe, we, we had that today, but it, it's a verse perhaps that's been helping you during the week. Uh, maybe it's an answered prayer that you've had that you've, 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 you want to just testify to in prayer maybe or in standing up and saying I prayed for this this week as Andy did this morning it's, it's, Paul is saying contribute what you've lived in the week and bring it into the, the whole body why? so that the whole body is built up so that I'm encouraged by hearing what Andy brought today. I know Andy very well, so I know the struggles he's been through since his mum dies. So I'm excited about this because we prayed about this, haven't we? I, listen, this is what the body of Christ is. It's not just me 
in my, sweet, in my little corner and you in yours. It's the body helping each other to grow in God. Listen, if you're not a Christian here this morning, you know, I don't know when you last came to church, but this is a, these people, some are rich, some are poor, some are bright as buttons and some are like me, you know, you know, you wonder what they're on. But it doesn't matter. We're a body. But actually we have a common father. And you can have the same common father. That's what the church is supposed to demonstrate. Listen, there's a family called God's family, called the church, which God says he holds in such high esteem because it's his, as it were, hands and feet on the earth. A word of instruction. Have you, have you ever thought next Sunday that actually you could bring something? I would love it if we, you know, the poor worship leader can't get in to do this. Yeah, I can't play this song because four or five people. But actually, if it's edifying, let's have it. Let's hear what God's doing. Now, we're not boasting here. It's all done to the glory of God. It's not, listen, oh, this, this has happened to me. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a sense of honouring God with it. What about this thing about a revelation? What could that be? It's just, it, I, I would suggest it's a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Perhaps you need to have help knowing what these are. Maybe it's knowing that somebody here is sick and they need prayer. Uh, maybe it's a prophetic word, as we had this morning. Listen, this is God speaking to people and the body being built up. What about tongue and interpretation? I won't spend long on this, but actually uh, the gift of speaking in tongues is primarily to be used as a private gift, and it's a gift that builds you up. Um, who was the lady that went to uh, Jackie Pullinger? I don't know if you've ever heard Jackie Pullinger's testimony when she first went to Hong Kong, to the walled city, uh, to bring the word of Jesus to people, and uh, she found she was working amongst drug addicts, this is a true story. She found she, she, had, uh, she had quite a lot of Mandarin, uh, and, but she, she found that she... You know, she, she was very hard work. They were smashing up the, the youth club that she was building and all sorts of things. And a young missionary couple said to her, do you speak in tongues? He said, well, I do, but I don't do it very often. So he said, do it often. Speak privately to God yourself, for it will build you up. And it will, it's you speaking to God in a language you didn't learn, uh, energised by the Holy Spirit, and coming before him, just you and him honouring God. And she said she started to do it for a quarter of an hour by, the, by her watch. And her testimony, I remember seeing her on Channel 4 on television. She said, my testimony is this. I don't know whether my Mandarin improved or what happened. But she said, from the time I started to do that, people started to listen to what I had to say and give their lives to Jesus. Listen, the, the, there are many churches that want to rubbish this. Paul says, don't forbid speaking tongues. Don't get out of control. Obviously, it's what Paul was writing here. But use this gift. If you, I, I, I'll say just a little bit more about that at about half past three when I get to the end. Just, but, but, but listen, but in the church, we have, that was so helpful this morning when you brought that interpretation. Because I'm standing there thinking, the Bible says, if nobody interprets, I've got to interpret. Right? But you did. And it was very helpful about, you know, the personal nature of God. Thank you very much for bringing that. And then Andy, bring, bring, you know, it, it helped him with that. This is the body working together. Very exciting. Very exciting. And, and so, there's something to be done in these things where not only are we living in the light, not, but when we come as a church, we're helping one another to grow in God and we're allowing the presence of God to come in. John Putman spoke to us last week about the presence of God. So helpful. And so we're not just satisfied being saved. We're saying, God, may I take what you're putting into my life and may I bring it as an offering to others. Can I, I want to finish here. just want to ask this question. And I can give you some homework. This is the question. People often ask me. I, I, this is the question. Is, are you sure if you've been baptised in this, or not sure if you've been baptised in the Holy Spirit? People often say, I, I'm not sure whether I have been. Now, it's almost like a minefield, this, this question, for some people. But for me, it's very simple. If you're not sure, then you probably haven't been. That's what I would say. I'm just telling you, not some deep theological thing. If you're not sure, but actually, you can be sure. And the John 7, 37 thing gives you the way. Get thirsty before God. 
come to him, find out whether it's biblical. That's another thing. And then ask him to baptise you in the Holy Spirit, like dowsing under a hose. And let, and let him just start to do it privately. I, I will give you some homework. I would suggest that you read through Acts 10, the whole of Acts 10. I read it through this morning, so it doesn't take forever. I read it through while I ate my porridge. Acts 10, and go on and read through to Acts 11, to, up to verse 18. Not because the rest you shouldn't read, but, but that's enough, isn't it? So Acts 10, through into Acts 11, and up to verse 18. You'll find there um, the story of how the apostles uh, brought the word of God to uh, some Italians, and, uh, and the Lord baptised them in the Holy Spirit. And there was evidence that they'd been baptised in the Holy Spirit. I think in that one it mentions that they, they, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Then there's another bit you could read, which is another in Acts, Acts chapter 19. And if you read the first seven verses, and that's a time when Paul met some Ephesian Christians. And there was something about them that he felt they were lacking something. The Bible's very practical. And he said, excuse me for asking this, but did you receive the Holy Spirit when you, became, you, know, when you got saved? And they said, Holy Spirit? We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. That was, that's my story. I gave my life to, to Christ as a, as a young boy, 14-year-old, in a crusader camp, and, and I asked Jesus to be my Lord, but nobody told me anything about the Holy Spirit. And then it was 10 years later, I met people that frightened the life out of me because, I, because they were so joyful. I thought, what's the matter with them? Can't they calm down a bit? And now I'm as bad as they are. But they shared with me who the Holy Spirit is. And when I realised who he was, I realised I could trust him, that I was going to go to heaven and trust him that I was actually born again, trust him with my money. So read those things. I, I, I'm, I'm saying this now, not stand up if you want to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. I'm saying it because Jesus said, you've got to know it's biblical. You've got to be convinced it's biblical. If you don't think it's biblical, don't go there. Jesus said, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. As the scripture has said, out of his innermost beings come rivers of living water. So I'm saying get thirsty. Read the scriptures and then finally ask in faith. Ask him and I don't know what the outcome will be. I don't know whether you'll prophesy or speak in tongues or, or maybe you'll avidly want to devour your Bible. I don't know what will happen. But I do know if you ask God, it'll be God because he's reliable. And this is what they prayed in the Welsh Revival. Revive your work, O Lord. Exalt your precious name. And may thy love in every heart be kindled to a flame. Lord God, we come before you as a church. We ask you that, Lord, we would receive all that you have for us. We wouldn't hold back. Lord, we want to be those that go around doing good. Not our good, but your good. We want to be those that bring hope to people when they are only facing hopeless news. And we want to be those whose faces and lives are windows into heaven that they might see what they can be as they ask Jesus to be their Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.